you more about that and also both about how monarch butterflies relate to the environment, the habitat, and the plants that they associate with. Now, before I uh, share my screen, um, most of the time when I share a screen, I can't see anybody's faces. So you are welcome to ask me any questions at any time. Uh, just unmute yourself and ask, and I'll also regularly pause um, kind of with the Bueller, Bueller style <laughs> if you all have any questions. If at any point I um, suddenly stop talking and mute myself, that may be because I'm having a coughing fit. So I just wanted to warn you there. But if I am saying anything that you can't understand or I'm talking too quickly, just feel free to interrupt, let me know, and you are good to go. So any questions from the start before I start that screen sharing process? Um, I'll try to uh, mo uh, moderate the chat if you, I, I forgot okay. to mention that. So if anybody has any um, things they wanna talk about, put in the chat, I'll bring them up. Okay, sounds good. But yeah, I certainly do not mind uh, interruptions or anything. So let's, uh, I should also warn you, I'm not the most technologically proficient person. Uh, so I'll, uh, so we'll see how this goes. Oh, whoa, I have no idea what just happened. Oh <laughs> so what I meant to do was to share with you um, my, okay, let's do slideshow from beginning. Do you all see something that says the magic of monarch butterflies? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Whoa, then I think we are on to an excellent start. <laughs> now, I should warn you, um, I do not own most of the photos throughout this presentation. Uh, some of them were taken from the internet. Others are courtesy of our fantastic volunteers from the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. As for what I do at the museum, I am the volunteer and community science coordinator. So the Pacific Grove Museum is located right in downtown Pacific Grove. That's also where I'm at. And uh, we're a small museum, just has a rich uh, both natural and cultural history that we try to showcase of Monterey Bay. But in addition, we also partner with the city of Pacific Grove at the Monarch Sanctuary. Now. Have you all ever had a chance to go to the Monarch Sanctuary in Pacific Grove? It tends to get overlooked by locals is something that I've found. If you haven't had a chance to go there, it's um, kind of about halfway between downtown and the lighthouse in Pacific Grove. The address itself is 250 Ridge Road. And um, one of the reasons that many locals tend not to go there is because it tends to be a very popular visitor spot. Um, but the city owns a location and we at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History kind of help out with the educational component there. And so with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about just what makes monarch butterflies so special. And they really are special. I have never encountered a animal like the monarch butterfly that just everybody loves. It doesn't matter like what their background is, their age, where they're from, just everybody loves monarch butterflies. They're like living stained glass and they just capture the imagination. I think it helps that there's no draw aside to monarch butterflies <laughs> whatsoever. Like, they're not birds, they won't poop on your car, they don't have teeth, they cannot attack you, they are not parasites, uh, they cannot sting you, and they're not even flowers, you cannot have an allergy against them. They are just kind of perfect in every single way. Um, and that's just what is amazing about them. In addition to the fact that well, they are designed to capture attention and go into more of that later. As for about the Monarch Sanctuary itself, this small area in Pacific Grove, trying to find the actual history of it has been a little bit hard, uh, but it was, there was a petition in the mid nineties by Pacific Grove residents to just preserve the last bit of Monarch habitat that was left in Pacific Grove. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> the monarch sanctuary. This little space is just designed to be the most monarch friendly location that you can find. They have the trees that monarch butterflies like to cluster in. They have nectar plants that they like to feed off of. It is just designed to be as monarch friendly as possible. The city of Pacific Grove has a team of volunteers who go out and maintain those plants. And as for the museum, our uh, fantastic team of volunteers help to educate the public about the monarch butterflies, helping them to locate them and understand what actions they can do to help protect them. Now, just give me a second. By the way, any questions so far? All right. <coughs> now, ooh. Sorry, my throat is just really wanting me to have a coughing fit right now. So about one, before you can really understand monarch butterflies, you have to understand how they compare to other butterflies. Monterey Bay is home to a good number of butterflies, but just take a look, noticing, say, the wingspan between them. Mother butterflies, um, they tend to be like, we have some gorgeous ones, like the little spring azure. It's a tiny little like shimmering blue um, the cabbage white, you can see how some of those distinctive eye spots that are so common among butterflies, eye spots that help to uh, essentially make a predator think that this butterfly is a much larger creature than it is. The painted lady may observe actually looks pretty similar to a monarch butterfly and that is no coincidence. And then we've also got like the swallowtails which are probably the largest uh, butterflies that we have beyond the monarch butterfly and just as beautiful in their own way. But you can see how the monarch butterfly itself is just much larger than them. Also, every single one of these butterflies are seasonal. The monarch butterfly is one of the few butterflies that is found year round, not in Pacific Grove, not in the Monterey Bay area, not even in any area, but it's still just found year round. You see, one of the things that makes monarch butterflies so special, and they are special. They are just the most iconic monarch butterflies. I even noticed that like, if you just try to generally find a, you know, default like butterfly, odds are it's going to pull up an image of a monarch butterfly. So monarchs tend to be much larger than other butterflies. And in addition, they are longer lived. Most butterflies only generally, once they enter the butterfly phase of their life, only tend to live like a week or two at most. Some of them only live to be a few days. But monarch butterflies live six to eight weeks and the super generation, which we'll get into later, lives six to nine months. Another thing is that their flight pattern, which is not something I could get a video of, but most butterflies, the way they fly, you can think of it like the way a housefly flies in these erratic patterns designed to make it so that predators have a hard time tracking them. But not monarch butterflies, they just soar. In addition, they are bright and visible. They don't need to camouflage and they don't have distracting uh, eye spots. And one of the things that makes them so special is they're just incredible migrations that they do. And so what it is that makes monarchs so special is the food that they eat. And that is milkweed. Now milkweed is just very good at being <laughs> toxic to everything in every way, shape and form. Milkweed is a plant that has so many defenses. One of them, the basic defense that it has against mammals eating it is that milkweed is hairy. Generally, mammals don't like the taste of leaves that have hair on them. So that's a common detraction against say deer. However, the real protection that milkweed gives itself is within the leaves itself, it has a toxic sap and there are depending on the species of milkweed, it can either be a cardiotoxin, so working on essentially 
the muscles, or it can be a neurotoxin. And there's pretty much no cure about it. You can produce, like with this scrub J right there, um, it can produce just instant, uh, instant vomiting, diarrhea, spasms. It's just pretty nasty stuff. But what monarchs do is that monarch larvae eat the leaves of milkweed. And instead of dying from it, they are able to retain the toxins within it. And the toxins of the milkweed stay within the monarch butterfly, even when it is an adult. The toxin stays in those very bright wings of theirs. And so because monarchs themselves are toxic, they don't need to avoid predators like uh, bees, or they essentially advertise themselves that they are dangerous and to stay away from them. And because they are advertising that they are toxic and that anything who eats them will get a bad reaction, like that scrub jay, which did take a bite out of a monarch butterfly wing and immediately felt the consequences, they don't need to hide. They don't need to have eye spots. All of their defenses are within the toxin that they get from milkweed. And, which is just so cool how everything comes from the food that they eat. All of that magic of monarch butterflies comes from that milkweed. And so other animals will try biomimicry, that is imitating them, having their same colorations without actually being toxic themselves. We have a, um, a Western lady over in the top right, which does have really beautiful uh, monarch-like patterns, and then down below a red admiral. Those are found in uh, Pacific Grove as well. So how are y'all doing? Any questions so far about anything? All right then. So the question then becomes, uh, since milkweed is the food of monarchs, in fact, Monarch larvae literally do not recognize anything else as food. If you put a monarch larva on another plant, it will not eat it. It only eats milkweed. So of course, the question for people who want to help out monarch butterflies is, well, should I plant milkweed? Well, the answer is complicated. Absolutely plant a milkweed garden if you live someplace where milkweed I'm sorry, plant a milkweed garden, not a monarch garden, but you know what I mean. Plant a milkweed garden if you live someplace where milkweed grows naturally. So that, you know, it's kind of a, a you know, common sense sort of thing. Plant the plants that are native to your area, right? And so the same with milkweed. If you live in a place where milkweed occurs naturally, then absolutely plant it. However, if you live someplace where milkweed doesn't naturally grow, like right here along the coastline, then don't plant it. There are a bunch of other uh, good native plants that monarch butterflies do like. While monarch butterflies are in Pacific Grove, Monterey Bay area, or at least in California in general, the adults will not be feeding off of milkweed, but they'll be feeding off of nectar plants. You know, just that nice uh, sugary substance uh, from plants. So there's, you know, daisies, lupines, uh, sunflowers, other things around here that is just absolutely great for them. But there is one thing as well that for those who do plant milkweed is to always make sure that they do plant milkweed that is native to their area. Unfortunately, the most common milkweed found in garden stores is non-native tropical milkweed. And I understand why. Tropical milkweed, it's not native, but it blooms year round. And milkweed is a perennial plant when it's, you know, it's not there during the winter seasons. And nobody wants to go to a garden store and essentially be given like, yes, here is some empty soil. And I can assure you that when you plant it in springtime, it will become a plant. Generally, garden stores prefer to have plants that look like plants uh, when ready to sell. But the fact that tropical milkweed is not perennial is exactly the problem. You see, monarchs come with parasites. We all come with parasites. 
even <laughs> unfortunately. It's something that they live with. It's something that they pass on. Um, I forget the long name of uh, the parasite, but it's a type of protozoan that's called OE for short. And um, so what happens is that uh, monarch females, they plant their eggs, the parasite gets put on the milkweed itself, and then, you know, larvae hatch, go into butterflies, move on, the milkweed dies, and it's fine. And then when the milkweed comes back, it comes up fresh and with no parasites. But the year round bloomer, the tropical uh, milkweed, it just keeps accumulating parasites year after year after year after year so that it becomes just in far more deadly concentrations than it would have been otherwise. And that horrifying picture on the right is what pictures of monarch butterflies look like who have uh, death from that parasite. So that's just something to look out for. I have a picture of native narrow leaf milkweed, or at least native to California, over on the left-hand side and tropical milkweed in the center. You can see that the narrow leaf milkweed on the left has much narrow leaves and look at how beautiful wavy like those leaves are as well. The tropical milkweed has very tropical colors, that bright orange and yellow, and also its leaves are much broader. Um, some scientists seem to think that the broader leaf milkweeds tend to have more potent toxins in them. But funny enough, monarchs do not go for the milkweed that has the most toxins. The monarchs tend to go for milkweed that has less toxins in them. And monarchs tend to go for younger milkweed as well because that milkweed has less toxins, indicating, and this is kind of a contentious study, so if Paul Meredith is there, uh, we might hear from you, uh, indicating that monarchs are not entirely immune to the toxins of milkweed. Like they have some natural defenses, but they do tend to go for the less toxic milkweed that is out there. So that's just something I kind of find fascinating. Any questions or anything? So when I see, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, when people, I, I see people promoting milkweed seeds or saying, we're giving you milkweed seeds to plant, like this is a great thing. I've never planted them. It never really occurred to me to follow through on it, but that I see that here sometimes. And I always was a little surprised because I never really thought they were native here. So you, you would say, don't do it because it's not. I would say plant native plants. Yeah. That's what I would say. I would, uh, because when monarch butterflies come to Pacific Grove, and I'll go more into the full, and by Pacific Grove, I mean all of Monterey Bay. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm from the Pacific Grove Museum, and I'm just accustomed to saying Pacific Grove. When monarch butterflies come to the Monterey Bay area, they're not in the phase of their lives where they need milkweed. Right. They just okay. need plants. And, uh, one other absolutely atrocious, and by, okay, I shouldn't have used such a strong word, but one negative consequence of planting milkweed where it isn't normally found could be that the presence of milkweed may, not scientifically proven, but may, speculatively may, induce monarch butterflies to enter a stage of their lives prematurely. It may induce them to essentially display behaviors that they wouldn't normally, and that might get them killed. Um, so yeah, it's more just like, but then again, the world is changing. This, we, we live in a world of climate change and plants are moving, animals are moving, migration patterns are going off the charts. So sometimes scientists just say, hey, if you wanna see if you know, you're, you can have native milkweed, try just planting milkweed and don't attend to it constantly, treat it like any other native plant and see if it grows. So, I was just yeah. going to say, is, um, uh, is there a, a map or anything of California that shows specifically where the native milkweed grows? Because so much of California is developed, and one of the first things that the egg does is get rid of milkweed. So I, who knows where it actually does grow? Um, 
it's since it's a California native, you might look up but look it up in a book and it's this California native and it's like, yeah, it'll grow out in California. So I wonder if there's any kind of more specific recommendations that you can find that you have. More than that, I have a community science project at the museums uh, oh. with called Milkweed Mapper. Oh. Uh, so just like I naturalist drawing in people who, you know, can take pictures of milkweed, pin a location to it, send it abroad. That way we can get the science of where milkweed is found. Oh, that's and a great idea. And if we can upload mm -hmm. a picture of it and get the species, then we're even more golden. So yeah, that's just, there's a lot of downsides to the information age, but just the amazing benefits of community science has just been, oh, I love it so much. So yes, Milkweed Mapper, um, connected with the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History, but we work with a conservation organization called Xerces, X-E-R-C-E-S, xerces.org. Um, and yeah, so Milkweed Mapper, so look that up, but also you probably know about Calscape, but yeah, narrow leaf milkweed is kind of the general recommended one for inland central California. So I have a, a quick question. Is there any move within the retail nursery industry to try to get the retailers to stop selling non-native? And I say this as a, uh, someone who has been a uh, in the gardening business for 40 years. And that one in the middle there, oh man, that is a big draw in the gardening world. And I love the argument that you gave to not grow it based on the, um, uh, the deformity that can happen to the monarchs. Primarily, I've always heard the argument not to plant it because you're keeping the population in, an, in the area beyond the time period that you want to be. But uh, is there any move? Because there'll be moves within the retail industry to remove really invasive plant material like the Mexican feather grass. So I'm just curious. Unfortunately, I don't know. There is a group of uh, individuals called Monarch Joint Venture, and I don't know if um, any within this area are working on it, but they, across other parts of the United States, they've tried working with agriculture, um, governments, and uh, retails in order to essentially have more monarch-friendly plants out there. But essentially, there are still, you, you all probably know them much better than I do, the places that do sell native plants here in uh, the Monterey Bay region. Like, there's, I think, a couple of places in uh, the Carmel Valley region that sell native plants. And uh, the Pacific Grove uh, Sustainability Committee uh, is a small group of uh, people, volunteers, and uh, awesome individuals who are trying to promote native plant use around here. And so are working on, you know, offering free native seeds, but I'm not sure about milkweed um, because milkweed isn't found along the coastline here. So I'm not sure. I would love for that to be a thing, but yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure what's being done locally. So yeah. All right. Thank you all. Those are excellent questions. Now, let's go into a little bit about some of the basics of the Western monarch uh, natural history. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I'm not training you all to be monarch uh, docents, which if you are interested, <laughs> monarch season generally resumes again in October. So, you know, just reach out to me. It's a lot of fun actually, um, but no, that's not what I'm doing. So for just some basics about the Western monarch, you'll notice that I'll be saying Western monarch a lot. That's because there are multiple populations of monarchs around the United States. Um, and as for what they eat, well, you know all about milkweed now, but the adults just generally feed off of the nectar of native plants. Their lifespan, 
six to eight weeks, except for the super generation of six to nine months. And despite the protection that they get from uh, the milkweed, they do have predators. The picture right there shows one that had a curious bite taken out of it from some sort of corvid, maybe a stellar or a scrub jay. You see, those birds are smart enough to know about biomimicry, but they're still fooled by the biomimicry. So their solution is to just take a small bite, see if they feel ill, and if they don't, then just continue to eat it, which is also brilliant, but also just like, but why? There, there, there are so many other things to eat, right? Um, but there is one, one loophole to the milkweed toxin. The toxin is only found in the wings. The toxin is not concentrated in the abdomen, in the body. And squirrels know this. And of course it doesn't have to be, you know, the native squirrel. It has to be like the European brought squirrel over that's figured it out. So squirrels um, are pretty common predators of monarch butterflies. And I just have to remind myself that the number of butterflies that are consumed by squirrels is absolutely nothing compared to uh, the detrimental, all the, you know, billions of butterflies that have been killed through human induced uh, things like habitat destruction. So that's something I have to remind myself of. And as for the Western monarch butterfly, its range is in the spring and summer, located in Washington and Oregon, and then in the winter, uh, found throughout California. <coughs> and I'll give you a second to look at that map while I recover uh, my breath for a second. There we go. So most people have heard about monarch butterflies that migrate down to Mexico. Now that is the Eastern monarch butterfly. The Eastern monarch butterfly is just found uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. And so they are found uh, during their Northern range pretty much all across the United States, east of the Rocky Mountains. And then they head down to uh, Mexico for the winter, but not west of the Rocky Mountains. I am so sorry, everybody. Just please give me a second. Probably tell that. <laughs> Thanks. So the Western monarch butterfly. The Western monarch butterfly does not migrate down to Mexico. Instead, Essentially, California is the Mexico. What they are looking for during the winter is a mild climate. And that mild climate, they found it right here, you know? So they simply do not need to go any further south. And their northernmost range is the Oregon and Washington. And now the reason why that is, is because once again, milkweed. Essentially, you can think of Oregon and Washington as their home. Oregon and Washington is their home. And that's where, especially inland Oregon, Washington, is where um, the milkweed is at. The larva will feed off of milkweed. The adults will feed off of nectar plants. That's it. Their six to uh, eight week lifespan is just perfect. Except then Oregon and Washington in the uh, winter, they get so cold that the monarch butterflies cannot survive. So even though they have the resources that they need up north, they would freeze up there if they stayed there year round. And all migrations, all migrations, whether or not you're talking about uh, monarch butterflies, gray whales, birds, what have you, all migrations are a, essentially a, um, a compromise between the resources that you need, but the environment you can survive in. Usually it's when there's a discrepancy between those, when there is an environment that you can't survive in at least part of the year, has the resources that you depend on to survive, that's when you get migration. 
And so because Oregon and Washington get so cold that they cannot survive, that's why monarchs head down to California. And as for where in California, it's kind of all of California, Mendocino County, kind of the north side, and then down to San Diego, uh, the south side. But there are kind of three main overwintering locations. There's natural bridges in Santa Cruz, there's Pacific Grove, and then there's uh, down further south, Pismo Beach, so right south of San Luis Obispo. Those tend to be the three main overwintering spots in California. And as for what the life cycle is like, well, they start off as just a tiny little egg that's just about the size of a sesame uh, seed. A female will lay a single egg under a milkweed leaf. Then she'll move on to another milkweed leaf and have another single little egg. Each egg gets its own individual, uh, gets its own individual leaf. And she could have up to 400 eggs, but generally will lay about 100. It's all dependent upon the number of milkweed, amount of milkweed that she can find. And the egg only takes about two to three days to hatch before it becomes this tiny, tiny little thing. Now, the kind of a dangerous moment in this uh, little caterpillar's life is its first bite of the leaf. Because if it hits a vein where the milkweed uh, sap is, then it'll splurt out and essentially drown that little larva. But if it eats a, you know, non-sappy section, then it will just continue to munch around in a little circle that gets wider and wider and wider, which is a very safety precaution way to go about it. It continues to grow until it becomes this. And look how it already at this stage has bright warning colorations advertising the fact that it is toxic and stay away. And at this point, it's like only like two weeks old. And from there, once it's about two weeks old, then it's going to go into the cocoon, also known as a chrysalis, to become an adult butterfly. And this instant when uh, every, pretty much everybody knows, oh yeah, caterpillars become butterflies, it's great. But the caterpillar enters into the cocoon, its body dissolves and then reforms into the shape of the adult butterfly. Which, oh, I find that so crazy. But it's not an entire, like, dissolve free-for-all. Uh, in the middle picture right there is what a butterfly uh, chrysalis looks like under an MRI. You can see that even though, you know, most of the creature is dissolved, there's still kind of a basic framework that then the cells reorganize around. And it turns out that that framework uh, is present even in the larva before it has entered into the cocoon phase. So there's already some structure there. It's not just a complete going into a blender, I guess. And then once uh, the butterfly is ready to come out of the chrysalis or the cocoon, you can see on the right, that's what it looks like when it's at that reemergent uh, phase. And yes, there is jewelry that looks just like you know, that's made to look like those chrysalises because they are just that beautiful. And so here you can see the emerging process. And take a look at the third picture uh, from the left or the second one from uh, the right, because you can see the moment when it emerges, how tiny the wings are and how gigantic the body is. One of the first thing it has to do is to be able to extend its wings, and then from there, flap the wings in order to trans uh, for what it has for blood called hemolymph to it. And then from there, that body shrinks in size as all of that liquid is transferred into the wings, which just kind of, you know, balloon out into that, um, what am I trying to say? Um, in, in, into that form that we uh, go to recognize. And now, then the question is, is that raising up monarch butterflies? Now, some people can do a really good job of raising up monarch butterflies, but it takes a lot of attention to detail because that stage when it emerges from the cocoon can be very delicate. And like, if they're not, if, if they're crowded or if just one factor is off, 
then more than likely it may pass away. Um, so I don't say that you shouldn't raise up monarch butterflies, but I'm saying that most people shouldn't. Um, oddly enough, one of the best places to raise up monarch butterflies uh, was a prison where raising up monarch butterflies was given as one of the like extracurricular activities that they can do. And they were just on it. They just were so attentive to the detail and everything. Uh, apparently they just raised up the world's best captive monarch butterflies ever. But, but you know, that's, but, but that's kind of a, an outlier as it were. But there was also some rumors, just I put this in here in case that you've heard that, oh, captive butterflies don't migrate correctly. Now it turns out that they do, um, at least the tagged ones that were studied. So that's not really a problem there. It's just whether or not you trust yourself to get all of the factors exactly correct to make sure that it's healthy. But moving on from there, then we have the adult monarch butterfly, which is kind of the monarch that we all know and uh, understand. I've put in here the summer butterfly because we've already talked about how they migrate, how, you know, they have their summer homes and their winter homes, but there's actually a huge, even a uh, physiological difference between them. So normally for the butterfly's life, uh, at this point, it's good to go. Notice the one on the left and the one on the right. Notice how they're not exactly identical. The one on the right you can see has two spots uh, on its lower wings, its hind wings, really close to the body. And also notice how its uh, veins are much thinner compared to the butterfly on the left. The one on the right with the spots, that is a male monarch butterfly. And that's something that all male monarch butterflies have are the thinner wings and those two spots uh, close to the abdomen right there. Whereas the left, uh, monarch butterfly right there is a female. And so the females, they lack the spots, but they do have the much thicker veins. So that's uh, one way that you can tell them apart. Um, as for what those uh, spots on the males do, um, they're called like, I forget what they're called. It's like feral uh, spots. We're not, scientists still aren't sure whether or not they actually have a purpose or it's more like vestigial, but hey, it's really helpful for us when we're trying to tell them apart. So I appreciate them. And at this point on the butterfly's life, what they do is that they feed themselves off of nectar plants to sustain them. They go find a mate and then female lays her eggs on uh, the milkweed. And pretty much after they mate, they generally don't live around uh, much longer than that. And that kind of is the butterfly's life and the whole cycle starts over. And as for some of those native plants, um, again, you all would know more about native uh, plants much more than I do. Um, I got some of these from xerces.org, like just good pollinator plants. But if you're not sure whether or not something is a good uh, monarch specific butterfly, well, honestly, if it's, if, if it's good for one pollinator, it's kind of good for all pollinators, unless you're looking for house for fly specific pollination plants. But butterflies in general kind of like plants that have wide spaces for them to land on. But of course they will also break the rules on that and go for nectar on uh, like lupines with tiny openings in them. So yeah, if, it, if it's a native plant and it has nectar, then they love it. And uh, the Pacific Grove Monarch Sanctuary also has non-native nectar plants that they're also very fond of. So yeah, if ever in doubt, just plant native plants and you're good to go. Oh, hey, there we have it. So as for at the monarch sanctuary itself, they have both native plants and non-native nectar plants there. Um, but all of these pictures were taken by one of our volunteers, Rick Parson, from Monarch Butterflies at the Monarch Sanctuary. So there's red bottle brush, uh, which is the one on the left, and daisy tree in the right. So just in case you were curious about the sort of plants that were at the Monarch Sanctuary, there you go. But you've also, I'm sure, have been to Ocean uh, View Avenue 
in and seen, you know, the carefully maintained ice plant and other non-native beauties that are so um, beloved here in Pacific Grove. So uh, uh, I'll just stop there before I say anything I shouldn't. Any questions? <laughs> Speaking of the uh, the purple carpet, do the monarchs like it? You know, I'm not sure. I yeah, I, I is that is is that the one that's? Oh no, no, they do not. The one that's all up and down the coast and PG and on all the postcards and mm -hmm. yeah seen a monarch butterfly I have seen monarch butterflies on ocean view I can't say I've ever seen them feeding off of ice plant no but that would have been could you imagine like if they did it would just be such a beautiful sight um but no I've I've yeah I can't recall seeing any uh walking along the ocean there yeah yeah no I I don't I don't believe they go for it at all so there we go. But yes, it's on all of the postcards here. <laughs> Before I knew, you know, I was a small kid and didn't know anything about native plants, I also thought it was delightful. Anyhow, <laughs> so now we're moving on to the phase of the monarch butterfly that we see here in the Monterey Bay area. You see, it's thought that once the temperature gets below a certain degrees, uh, and what that is, not sure. Could also be, you know, uh, length of daylight. Again, exactly what that trigger is, it's not entirely known. But those monarchs that are born under those conditions, instead of just finding mates and moving on to the next generation, these ones have an instinct to migrate and to cluster. Also, they won't mate until another six to nine months. And, um, I'm not entirely sure about the math, but for something that lives, you know, six to nine months, six to eight weeks normally, now living six to nine months, that's a, what, like a 12 times uh, lifespan or so. So yeah, that's a very impressive difference uh, there. And below you can see a picture of monarchs clustering and as for why their cluster will go into that in more detail. And here is also a picture of just what um, the sanctuary down in Mexico, at least in the mid night, actually no, in the mid eighties looked like. Just all of the monarchs that were clustered there in order to keep that warmth uh, that they need. It just looks, yeah, the, the, as you can tell, they, the, those are not red leaves on the trees. Those are all monarchs hanging out. And, we also have here um, some of the uh, tagged uh, monarchs, and so you can see exactly what their what their migration pattern is. So that you can see that they're just very direct. That they go from Oregon, they go from Washington here, and they generally don't tend to make too many detours. Now I should mention that for a monarch population that has everything they need, like say Florida, has both a climate that never gets cold and has milkweed. Monarchs don't migrate. So they have a non-migratory population of monarchs in Florida, also in Hawaii. So there is that. But as for what clustering is, now you can see uh, another one of our uh, volunteers, Mary Dayton took this beautiful photo. And you can see what the monarchs cluster, they all gather together on the leaves of a tree and they all hang out together, kind of like cascading down. This is not for warmth, so it's not like penguins, uh, because uh, monarchs are cold-blooded creatures. Huddling together doesn't necessarily provide much in the way of warmth, but what it does provide is protection from the elements. A single monarch by itself, the wind comes and off it goes. A whole bunch of monarchs together, the wind comes, and that kind of cascades like uh, shingles on a roof. So being together does help protect them from the elements. And they are so very choosy about the particular trees. I believe that's one of my slides. Oh, well, um, I know I go into the trees that they like to cluster in eventually here. Um, 
it helps that a single butterfly weighs only half of a gram, which is either half a dollar bill or half a paper clip. So you choose uh, which analogy you prefer. And so they can just hang off of the lace lichen because they are so very lightweight. And they just can continue to grasp that little bit of lace lichen or even sometimes on each other without falling off or making much of an impact. There's also one strange thing. When the temperature gets below 55 degrees or so, monarchs cannot move their wings. They can walk, but their wings are essentially too cold to move. So if you ever get to the uh, monarch sanctuary in the early morning, you might see some butterflies that look like they are shivering, which is kind of what they're doing. They're moving in order to try to uh, put more movement into their wings, try to get them warmer. But they'll essentially stay in that protected space in that cluster until it is warm enough for them to move. So any questions there? Okay, then give me a minute while I have another coughing fit. I'll be right back. There we go. There we go. And finally, I have uh, pictures that I didn't borrow, but I was able to take myself at the Monarch Sanctuary. <laughs> so as for what it is that makes the perfect tree, it has to be the perfect tree that is tall enough, um, that has enough cover, enough branches to provide shelter from uh, the winds, but also has to have enough gaps in between so that sunlight can get through in order to warm them up. The monarchs will stay in that cluster until the sunlight hits them, until it gets warm, and then suddenly they'll all just break off at once in this beautiful burst. And seeing a cluster burst is just one of the most gorgeous sights out there. And so the trees that they generally like, uh, and when the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History Every single week, uh, we go to the monarch sanctuary and count the number of monarch butterflies that are there at the sanctuary. But in addition to just counting the number of butterflies that are there, we also keep track of which trees they are in, uh, what tree, what species, and so forth. And so this year, we were able to determine that um, Monterey pine and Monterey cypress, the native trees, were greatly favored by the monarch butterflies. Um, Non-native eucalyptus is also planted at the Monarch Sanctuary and is everywhere in Pismo Beach as well and in natural bridges. Um, so the non-native eucalyptus is also favored by the monarch butterflies, but just at least this year, not as much. It's really funny because monarch butterflies do not go to the same trees uh, every single season. They don't even go to the same trees every single night. Like a monarch butterfly, will leave its cluster one day and then return to a completely separate tree the next. So they do not have a particular tree that they will favor every single season. Now, one thing I think is, is that the lace lichen seems to be a huge draw for them, just something easy to grasp and hang on to. And eucalyptus does not get lichen. So, but eucalyptus does have those long, narrow leaves that are also, I guess, maybe have the same sort of ability to grasp onto. I'm, I'm not sure there, but they do like that. So those are gender, the trees that are found in uh, the monarch sanctuary. You know, if, um, mm -hmm. if way back when monarchs were all over the peninsula, because the, you know, not just PG isn't the only one that has cypress and, and pine, Monterey pine, you know, the whole peninsula does. So why, I wonder, are they only found in PG? Is, did they used to migrate to the rest of the peninsula? That is an absolutely excellent question. So we count both the monarch butterflies that are in the monarch sanctuary, and uh, we partner with Xerxes in order to count all the butterflies across Monterey Bay. Uh, this year, 
definitely the largest population was at the monarch sanctuary, about 14,000. There, part of it may be that they may be at other places that are just inaccessible. That's one of the reasons that when we count the population, they do it here in California, not farther up north, because when they're in the spring and summertime, they go to places that are less habitable to humans. But when they're in California, they're by places where humans are at and they're just easier to count. So it may be that there were big populations in like Big Sur or someplace else. There were some that were at Andrew Malera State Park, but not that 14,000 that was at the peak at, uh, at uh, the Monarch Sanctuary, not even just like a thousand at most. There was maybe a few hundred at Point Lobos. Um, George Washington Park in Pacific Grove used to be a huge place uh, for them as well. But it's not just about the nectar plants and the trees. There's also things to consider like the underbrush as well. Here, I'm gonna go back a slide. So notice in the middle that monarch uh, butterfly, how it's, um, it's it's within a it's within a, a a cypress tree, but it's also like with the pine needles and the leaves that are around it, or uh, they depend on the clover to be able to climb up. Uh, when a monarch monarchs often do fall from their clusters, and so when they do fall from their clusters, they need to be able to climb back to a place of safety where they can await the sun. And so they need that underbrush in order to be able to climb back up to a place of safety for the sun to warm them up before they can fly. So it may be, I'm not sure that like George Washington Park, a lot of the underbrush has been like Rip Van Winkle has been cleared out to make space for paths, but we don't have data to necessarily to support the why we won't be able to do that unless those habitats are restored in all of the variations as they should be and then see if maybe that draws in monarch butterflies. But we'd also be doing that at a time of climate change and, you know, just general chaos. So even then we might not necessarily get the results that we would need. So in short, I don't know why Pacific Grove. Um, the monarch sanctuary is one of the last like preserved habitats, but it's not the only one, you know? We've got the Del Monte forest, we've got Point Lobos. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what exactly it is. Monarchs are picky creatures, and I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> Just like, you know, seahorses, they're so beautiful and they're so high maintenance. <laughs> so it's just, I don't know if there's a life lesson there. So, <laughs> We, we tend to get a lot of questions as to how on earth do you count butterflies anyway? Well, it's kind of um, an extrapolation process. So here we have our volunteers on the left who are counting the monarch butterflies. And then on the right, we have essentially what you do is that you learn to identify what a group of say 10 monarch butterflies look like. You know, you have, okay, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I know what a group of 10 looks like. And then you go 10, 20, 30, 40, et cetera. And then from there, as the population gets bigger, you learn to identify what a group of 20 looks like, or even a group of 50, and then go like 50, 100, uh, 150, and so forth. But in addition to counting all the butterflies that are in the clusters, you also count all the butterflies that are on the ground and alive, all the butterflies that are in the air, and all the butterflies that are by themselves. Uh, but we don't like butterflies that are in the air for counting purposes because how are you supposed to know that the butterfly that's over here didn't actually move over here and now you're cutting, counting a butterfly twice. So when you're counting the butterflies, you go in the very early morning, like right as the sun is getting up, right when you are freezing your toes off, right when the butterflies are too cold to move and that's how you avoid that one. It's um, lots of fun. Actually, it is fun. It's a good way to start the morning. <laughs> And you do tend to get uh -huh. beautiful while you do it. So yeah, any questions there? All right. So what all of this counting data has learned is, well, what I have alluded to many times, which is that the butterflies are very sensitive creatures. And in that way, they're a very important ambassador for what 
uh, any animal impacted by humanity is like. So since the 1980s, since essentially people started counting butterflies, since the 1980s, their numbers have declined by 99.9%. And so there we have like what a group of butterflies from the 1980s would be for every like 160 that were there, there would be only one today. But even then, the 1980s are just a small fraction of the antidotal tens of millions of monarch butterflies that used to come up and down California. And as for the why, well, California at the beginning of Monterey based time, right when Pacific Grove was just being founded is very different. Um, early reports used to say that uh, being in uh, Pacific Grove back when it was a small Victorian camp, um, when this place was a small Victorian camp that the air would look like an orange shimmering veil because of all the butterflies that would be in the air. People would leave their camp and then the entire garden would just fly off at once because of all the butterflies that were, nest that were there on the ground. There were reports of people having to sweep butterflies off of their doorstep because there were just that many monarch butterflies. But back then, Pacific Grove was just a couple of tents inside a dense forest. Now, instead, we are a couple of trees inside a dense town of how So the conditions of what Pacific Grove was historically is very different than what Pacific Grove is today. Habitat loss, and that's both urban and agricultural as well. I have these two pictures. Um, this uh, picture on the left was in the 1970s, as this space on the right is what it is today. That's where they were standing in the 1970s, trying to preserve one of the last bits of undeveloped forest that was in Pacific Grove. And you can see what it became today. That's also where Michael's Taqueria is. So I'm, um, you know, can't hate it entirely, but and that point by the 1970s was already a big fall from what, you know, the historic home of monarch butterflies was. I'm going to keep emphasizing that, like, the 1980s, the 1970s were already a steep decline from what it is today because an odd psychological thing that happens uh, to humans is that every single generation, we have kind of like a short term generational memory loss. Like we see what the world was like when we were kids and then we see what it's like today. And then so we compare what the world was like as kids as like the perfect ideal, not understanding that no, what life was like as kids was not great, was not the ideal. That was already a steep fall from what it should have been before you were born. And this is something that uh, conservation scientists and organizations come off against all the time is kind of that when you have a problem that is going, you know, hundreds of years, it can be really difficult to make people understand that now we, 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 there, there, there's a long way back uphill. But luckily, understanding the problem is the first step towards having people doing things to fix it, which they are. 2020 was just an awful year for everyone, including the monarch butterflies. Um, so the monarch butterflies, um, is, they would be listed as endangered, except that during this modern era, there are a lot of animals in trouble. And so even though the monarch butterfly, the Western monarch specifically, does, based on its collapsing population, count as endangered, they are just other animals of higher priority. Even monarch butterflies, well, you know, I mean, think of white sharks, rhinos, and everything else that needs our help too. But in, so they've been under the extinction level, the population where it had been like, oh, yep, can't help them now for at least the past uh, five years. Then 2020, there were fewer than 2000 monarch butterflies counted across all of California. And 
when 30,000 was considered the population extinction. So Pacific Grove that year had zero monarch clusters. There are a few individual monarchs, but none that actually clustered. And everybody was like, great, is this it? Is this the end of the monarch butterflies? <laughs> well, and then for the picture, we have that picture of that Mexico overwintering site from the mid eighties versus what it was like uh, just like 10 years later. Not deliberately putting you in suspense, just needed some more tea. But then came a very unusual year. So I came to the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History fully expecting to, you know, hash out the, oh yes, monarch butterflies, their population is awful, but here's what you can do to help. Instead, what I got was in October, our first cluster with just 1,000 monarchs there, which was simply incredible. And then from there, the numbers kept on going. And so just look at that photo taken uh, by our volunteer, Rick Parsons. Just look at that. Uh, the peak count that we had was uh, 14,025 in, I forget if it was late November or early uh, December. I think it was early December. But the biggest question that we're getting is, well, why? Why is this happening? Why are we just getting this amazing rebound with an estimated of 200,000 across California, as opposed to the 2,000 of last year? And also this would make it the highest count that we've had in five years. So gosh, that's simply just been amazing. But there's a lot of things to take into consideration, most of which um, kind of equates to we don't know. Now I'll be right back. Hi everyone. So about why monarch butterflies have been coming back, part of it just may be that when a population is as small as it is, 200,000 is amazing, but still isn't, you know, the tens of millions that it used to be. Um, and so when a population is this small, it could be that just like small fluctuations that with a healthy population would go unnoticed because there are just so many of them, those small fluctuations, those small factors have huge impacts for a tiny population. For instance, um, 2020, in addition to just being a bad year for everything, was also a drought year. And so milkweed did not necessarily do well, but then milkweed did better. And then so we get a better, uh, and then so we get a better uh, monarch population as opposed to it. There's also maybe the idea that the fires of 2020 well, the first things that come back after a fire are the weeds, the flowers. So maybe that helped uh, milkweed out. Again, scientists aren't sure. What we can just do is just continue to count them and see what next year brings. But there's also the fact that when 2020 came around, everybody was forced to take a break. And many people did make changes to their garden. I saw many people switching to native plants or were planting milkweed or doing other things. Um, the government in California just passed a bill for planting uh, native plants along highway roadsides. Uh, other states have put that in and it's done pretty well so far. And um, community gardens have become more of a thing. So maybe it is that these individual actions, also people voting for those legislative actions that are better for the environment, have been taking a better effect. I would like to say that yes, this is, because the thing is, is that in order to have hope for the future, we have to take action. Without action, there can be no hope for the future, but also for people to take action, they need to feel hope. So it is kind of that both are needed together. And the monarch butterflies, that's what they are. This was the year when there was an animal that we thought was just gone and it managed to be able to come back. 
And so people are seeing the monarch butterflies as just a symbol of hope and are using that in order to take action to plant native plants to, yeah, actually do go out and vote and such things. And so for that, I just say thank you to everyone. Um, you all, the Marina Tree and Garden Club, like you are already 100% on like, you know, native plants and so forth. So good for you for already being those uh, activists that is exactly what we are hoping for. And um, it doesn't matter where you live, it, just when you take actions to help protect the planet, you are taking actions to protect all members of it, including the monarch butterflies. And so for that, everybody, I just say thank you. Thank you for doing uh, what you do. And if you have any questions, you are welcome uh, to come visit me at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. And uh, we have, you know, we have our own native plant garden that uh, definitely could use some help of people who know what they're doing. What? Before I came to the Pacific Grove Museum, I was a marine biologist, so I know all about my algae. I'm just uh, still getting a bit up to date on my terrestrial plants. And then there's a uh, monarch season itself when it comes around. We have all those monarch activities and other things as well, but just come on by to say, say hi. And I appreciate you all giving me this chance to come and talk uh, with you. So for that, it's kind of what I have. Do y'all have any questions for me? Um, I'll, I have a question. Absolutely. Uh, I was gonna say that they're actually not a question, but more of a statement. Um, for people that are looking for native plants to plant in their yard, uh, Xerces.org has uh, coupled with uh, a, a program called bloomcalifornia.org. And you can uh, go online and they have all kinds of different lists of plants that you could be planning to help uh, support native pollinators. And they have a list of nurseries. And I think the nurseries that are local to this area are gonna be uh, Hana Nursery, um, uh, Blue Moon, and then there's another one that I don't recognize. It's like a, a retail nursery, private nursery. You have to um, get a hold of them and put your order in that way. But in any case, it is an opportunity for people to find what kind of native plants might grow around here. I did a quick perusal. They don't sell any milkweed, so we're safe. Uh, so <laughs> they do have quite a few other um, great choices, though. So I just thought I would point that out. That's awesome. Thank you. Because that is like the number one question we get is how is where to find the native native plants. So thank you. Is there a, a lurch in population on the East Coast butterflies like there was here? Yes, but I don't know as much about <laughs> that population decline in uh, the East Coast, um, simply because the numbers that they get are just so much larger. Um, than they have, but yeah, they have also experienced a severe decline. I don't think <laughs> it is the 99.9% .9 that it has been for the Western uh, monarch, but in 2019 was weird that they had what seemed to have been a population influx similar to what we had this year, and then 2020 went down again, so oh, yeah, so I'm not, so I don't know their population trends as well as the West Coast. One cool thing is that uh, the Hawaii population, uh, that whole like island genetics thing, they have a population of white monarch butterflies that would normally just be, you know, like a rarity, but being in a small island, they have a better chance to reproduce. And so they have a pretty good population of white monarch butterflies in Hawaii, which is just kind of cool. Mm. Mm -hmm. cool. When you guys uh, do the count of the monarchs uh, in the morning, do you do a hand count or do you take pictures and try to outline or? Ooh, great question. A uh, hand count uh, with binoculars. Yeah, okay. Like, and you have someone else double check it or? Perfect, yes. We always have at least two people counting and the numbers have to be within like 15% of each other. Okay. <laughs> if they're off, then you have to recount them. And then we have multiple people generally taking notes and then we compare the numbers to make sure that everybody counted the same number of clusters. And that whole compare and contrast is, 
So yeah, so when you first get out, the best thing that you can do is have a partner who can describe a tree in similar language that you understand. Because when okay. people are just like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to count uh, the one that's on um, the Monterey pine, you know, the branch that's over on the right, <laughs> curving around. So if you have somebody who's like, yes, I see what you mean and I get it, then you're good. Okay. <laughs> So that's kind of the biggest part is learning how to speak each other's language of trees. Oh yeah, it sounds like it, it would be hard to count. I don't know. I just feel like I lose count just because no. you, if you lose a spot, you know, you get it. You get the hang of it really quickly. Um, yeah, like it, it's like honestly, the the closest thing is like trying to find like like stargazing. That's kind of what the closest thing is, you know what's it's a random pattern of stars in the sky except no you identify them and okay. they're able to like say find the andromeda galaxy or uh you know a globular cluster it's kind of the same it's, it's i think it's the similar principle stargazing and monarch uh counting uh, repeat <laughs> counters that you kind of rely on because they're good at it and they've done it yeah and Fortunately, one of our world's best counters uh, recently moved out of state. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a shame, but yeah, we have uh, some good people like um, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie Eidenholm is, uh, she's awesome. She also does uh, field trips as well. And she's been my mentor for having to count, which I've just absolutely got terrible vision. So I'm not good at it. Usually I'm a note taker. <laughs> Yeah. Like how much longer do they stay now for the winter? Theoretically, um, you know, excluding climate change and all uh, sorts of fun things, um, theoretically, monarch season starts, they start arriving in October, their peak season is November through January, and then they kind of start to taper off as they start to head inland um find mates um and so forth but also just as their numbers do drop through the season but the thing is is that their numbers are starting to fall now but the at the beginning of january we had about ten thousand, and last week we had nine thousand five hundred. we'll be counting again a uh, day after tomorrow so i'm guessing that we'll see about nine thousand. um but even though it's a smaller population, I still do recommend heading out to the Monarch Sanctuary if you haven't had the chance because the weather's been warmer and they've just been so active. Uh, they've been favoring a tree that's right close to the trail. And so they're just so easy to see and they've just been like bursting from their clusters right and left, almost like confetti. And it's just been great. Nice. Oh, and I should have left my contact information, which I didn't, but I'm going to put that in the chat right now. So if you all want to, you can just reach out to me at johnston at pgmuseum.org or I'll just leave it right there. So yeah, if you all ever want, just feel free to reach out and thanks for having me by this evening. Thank you. Do you know if the uh, do you know if the wildflower show is going to be going up soon at the museum? Don't think it's happening this year. No, not this year either, huh? Uh, yeah. So um, that I I know that that's just one of the biggest things of Pacific Grove is the wildflower show. So not having it up would just be so very contentious. So while right now the city is saying no or maybe it'll be at, instead of at the museum, at like the Chautauqua building instead. So I'm not sure, but I mean, did y'all hear about what happened when the city cut down an elm tree? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine that if they decided to not have a wildflower show that there would be an uh, even stronger reaction. So I'm just gonna see what every day brings us and we'll see how it goes. Oh. Well, good luck. I love the wildfire show. It's incredible. If you haven't been, definitely oh. put that on the calendar too. Yeah. If it, if it happens. 
<laughs> Go ahead, Julie. Oh, I was just, that was a clap. I just wanted to thank you for joining us and um, really enjoyed all the, your enthusiasm and uh, definitely some of the information uh, about what's going on over PG. I'm, I'm thinking we need to post the address uh, to kind of remind people to go take an opportunity to go visit. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's great to even see the, uh, um, the grizzly. We gotta go and see the grizzly every so often to <laughs> make sure it's still there. <laughs> it is. It's it, it is glorious. Once it's yeah. And there's all, all the uh, birds that you know you can identify. Are that's really a great place to. If you've seen a bird out in the garden, and you're not quite sure, go to the PG Museum and see if you can find it there. That's if you're true. And adopt a bird if you want to. <laughs> and yeah, they've got you can. I don't know what the adoption rate is, but that's how they they keep their birds, uh, their stuffed birds, um, cleaned and taken care of. People adopt them. So anyway, well, oh, thank you so much. Geez. And I should also, sorry, number one most common question that we get is from people thinking that the Butterfly Sanctuary is the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History, but no, different places, different sites, uh, about like a little more than half a mile away from each other. But it's a really nice walk. So yeah, but you, but you all are locals. So I like that, you know, there, there's a really big difference between, you know, talking with people who know this area already and you know people who are visiting so I appreciate that okay. yeah. any other questions Everybody. I guess we'll see ya see you at the museum thank you thank you so much bye good evening bye. Bye.